So I'm going to give you a little anecdotal evidence, not, um, not probably anything statistical yet because I'm just barely starting to work the data over the course of a couple years here. Um, but we've been in Nebraska trying really hard to make our annual land application training, which is what is required by livestock producers every five years in Nebraska um, as part of our regulations. Um, We've been trying to make it more interactive because the folks that we're teaching, majority of them, have seen us before. Not once, not twice, but probably three times, some of them. And so if we continued to teach the same thing over and over, they would be really upset. Um, and we do have to teach the same thing over and over because we have the regulations we've got to cover. Um, so, so we've been trying really hard to make it a little bit more interactive, more fun. Um, it's better, it's easier, funner to teach. Um, as well this way. So uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we're seeing as we've tried to, to do that. So in 2017, I implemented my calibration demonstration that I'm going to show you guys today and have you guys work through. Some of you I know have seen it before. I did this all, I did the calibration, actually taught that at um, Manure Expo this last summer. Um, so in 2017, I implemented it, and this is just showing the respondent. So from zero, zero is like zero knowledge improvement. This is what the respondents told me, that they had zero knowledge, sorry, knowledge increase. And then uh, four is significant knowledge increase. And so in 2017, we had about a two, that two was like our main, these are kind of the curves of, of what they selected. So to compare 2016, we had you know quite a few threes, some two, quite a bit of twos and threes. 2017, um, I implemented these kits, and I think pe some people were very confused by them because, I mean, who puts a manure spreader in a shoebox? So, uh, so I think people were a little bit confused by it. The educators weren't really sure what they were doing. Some of them told me they were very scared to teach that because it like lost control of their classroom. The kids or the, the adults in the room had to actually be doing something instead of them standing up front talking or playing a video. And so that was a kind of a transition year that, that it was a challenge. Um, but then since then, in 2018, things are going up. You can see, and again, I don't know if this is really significant yet. I don't, I haven't really looked at the numbers yet, but all of a sudden we have a lot more fours and people that are saying, wow, we really learned a lot. All right, so this year we added manure value, uh, a different kind of activity that Rick's going to show you after a bit. And uh, it was, again, we see general knowledge increase Oops. Uh, here that, that we have a lot more fours than we had even in years past. We still had quite a few twos last year. Uh, and then this year we totally changed it. We had almost, I think this is like three moderate increase. So before, I was always looking at anything from a moderate to significant increase. And this year I decided, I was like, I did my, my, my not stats, but I was looking at the percentages of people for my impact reporting, and I'm like, it didn't change. What's going on? And then I got to look in, and I was like, well, just because we have lots of moderates and significant, we had a lot more significance than we did moderates. And so I switched, and I started talking about the threes and fours instead of the two threes and fours. Um, and those numbers, I think, for most of the sessions that we added hands-on activities to, we had like a 26% increase. And again, I don't know, I haven't studied those numbers very closely, but it was, it seemed to me like there was quite a bit of difference between 2018 and 2019. On setbacks and stockpiling, I have that one down here also that we'll look at. I actually completely wiped out the PowerPoint presentation for that particular activity. And we just said, you know, we had talked about setbacks and stockpiling during our regulations talk. And I, so I handed them this activity and said, go do it uh, with very little uh, 
explanation. We did hand out the, the little cards as a reminder of what those regulations were uh, so that they could then take those home with them. So we don't see a ton of differences here, but you can tell that there is less of the ones and twos this year. Again, that was probably pretty scary for educators to not have any sort of introductory PowerPoint or anything. Um, and sampling, we didn't have any presentation changes. Um, I've used the same recording for the last like three, four years, uh, or a version of the same thing, and we didn't change any of that. I did, I don't know, they're back in 2014, 15, add a kind of a interactive activity there, but not, uh, it was still PowerPoint based, so it wasn't incredibly interactive. But what I think is interesting here, we felt like overall they were happier with the program. We didn't have like a lot, everything, even the presentations that we didn't make any changes to, the numbers still skewed towards that significant increase because we figured we had some kind of better satisfaction from the program. Uh, that's the last slide that I actually have. But the other piece of it that seemed like it was really different this year is we had a lot more people that actually wrote on their evaluation than gave us comments and suggestions. And again, it's totally anecdotal. We don't have any statistics to back it up or anything. But uh, in years past, people are really hesitant to write anything on an evaluation. Has anybody ever had that issue? Like, nobody ever writes on it. Um, we did ask one question a little bit differently. I asked what was the best part of this program, and I got tons of responses there instead of just other comments. Uh, but I still, even I had that question, I also had the other comments and suggestions, and they filled in both of them. Like, I think there was, and there was lots of them that said the instructors were great and that kind of thing. And so I think a lot of that is because we really had, we weren't standing up there preaching to them. They actually had some, some involvement and they had to actually interact with us. And so I think that improved things. Any questions about this much of it? And then I'll show you what we're actually doing. Yeah? Could you step back and kind of tell us what is required of these people? Sure. So, uh, like, our life, the way our regulations are written, the livestock operations in the state of Nebraska that are over a thousand animal units or have some kind of an operating permit, either NPDES or a state operating permit, are required to attend training every five years. And so that tra training includes calibration, regulation, sampling, um, I'm trying to think of what the other things are off the top of my head. Uh, but yeah, the phosphorus index and and nitrogen management planning, that kind of thing, nutrient crediting. <laughs> so they have to have all of these things. We have like eight or nine different topics that we have to cover for those that are taking the training for the first time. For those that are taking the training for the second, third, fourth, fifth time, whatever, they have uh, a shorter period of time that they come. We're contemplating changing this a little bit, but. Um, Traditionally, they come in the morning for the first couple hours. We talk about some updates to the regulations. We have to cover four main areas. We have to cover um, operation and maintenance of their plan. We have to cover regulations. And we have to cover um, an emerging issue of some kind. And then, and then planning all have to be part of that morning session and then we can go on to and then they are dismissed and so it's really those people that have to that don't want to sit through the same things that they've done over and over and over again um, for a lot of folks they are not doing their own um, record keeping and all of that they're hiring a consultant to do with that so um, or they hire a custom applicator to do the actual land application so a lot of them aren't doing those things themselves, so it's really hard for them to want to sit through our training. Because while we think it's relevant, and we try to make it as relevant as possible, a lot of them are the manager, and they don't do any of it themselves. But they're there because they have to be. Is that a permit requirement, or do you have to have a rule of 
That's a state regulation. It is a state rule that they have to have manure training every five years. No, no, it's actually a rule. Yeah. Do you do anything with the medium sized tankers, small pounds? We encourage them to come to the same training because virtually everything is completely relevant to them. Uh, but we're, we've not been very good about getting them. If you got a way to get them, we'd love to hear it. Yeah. Do your commercial manure applicators also have to attend that? No. In the state of Nebraska, we do not have any requirements for commercial applicators to come. Some of them do. Um, and we've talked about adding um, a module for them, but we've not gotten that, that done. Mostly they don't want anything. <laughs> they want to fly under the radar and not get regulated. All right. Go to the next one then. So I'm not going to actually spend any time teaching you about the importance of calibration, but this is the slides that we actually go through, and I'm just going to flip through them quickly so you can see what things we're talking about. We talk about nutrient crediting, we talk about setting up your equipment properly um, and why that's important. We talk about how distribution can is not always good and how we can improve it. We talk about this study to tell about that. Um, here's how we talk about how we can improve in uniformity. Um, I need to delete that slide because it doesn't exist anymore. And then we talk about the various steps to go through um, each of the different types of calibration. So for each one of these, I have a separate shoebox kit here. And I'm just I'm going to stop doing that, show you kind of what's in these kits. And then I'll actually have you gather around the table um, when we break. I'll, I'll bring somebody else up here and they can talk too. Uh, but inside my calibration, demonstration. This one happens to be the sheet method. I have, this is just laminated sheets. I have dry erase markers in here that they can actually write the calibration calculations on here. We do have an example application record. This is not actually used in the kit, but it does show them this is the piece of this that you would have to keep for your records. That's what we have to use in Nebraska. This is what you have to put in your records. These are the calculations. They don't have to see the actual calculations, but here's how you do it, and we just walk right through it. Uh, I'll explain this a little better when we are actually sitting down there and you're working through it. This is the, the cheat sheet for the scales. Um, they measure in ounce, pounds and ounces because this, for example, is one of your tarps. And so to scale everything down, we have this little cheat sheet that goes from ounces to ton, however many um, pounds that is appropriate. And each one has a little bit different um, scale. But like this cheat sheet has, this is if you are on the 100 pounds, like for every ounce or every pound on that little scale, it's 100 pounds. And so it just multiplies it for you so that there's less actual calculations. You do everything in the, in the big scale that you normally would. And then we have a ruler for this one because you got to measure your sheets. So you got to know what, how big your tarps are. So that is calibration. Uh, we've created uh, some maps. Uh, uh, and you should have an example of them. And we've begun to do exercises in the class ar around those maps. Uh, this last year we used this particular map for two purposes. One was uh, trying to get the uh, individuals to recognize the value of manure. And once you recognize the value of your particular manure product, which of these fields would you go to? And we have a discussion around that. And uh, I may pull up one slide here just to kind of help you understand how we connect the two. The second thing that we do 
uh, around this exercise is to have people think in terms of which of these, oh, uh, which of these fields, if I apply manure tomorrow, which of these fields are going to have a, an odor risk for neighbors and which do not? And so can I do some <coughs> scheduling uh, of which field I apply on to minimize that risk to neighbors? Uh, our, our rough guess in Nebraska is about half of our odor complaints come from land application of manure. Uh, and that's, that's really rough, but we get a lot of complaints that are related to the land application, that one day of exposure. So if we could eliminate that, I think that would reduce some of the, the local concerns and some of those late night phone calls you get from neighbors. And, and you, you talk about this, every, everyone in the room has had those phone calls. And so it, this tends to resonate. So this is what we try to, to impart to them is that there are certain conditions that cause that plume of smoke, and we say smoke and odor, roughly the same idea in terms of how they disperse. What causes that plume of smoke to disperse upwards and dissipate and the neighbors near the ground never experience it? Or what caused it to stay <coughs> near the ground uh, and, and for those neighbors to experience? And then how do we use a weather forecast to predict which of these conditions are going to occur? And, and then from that, convert that into a field that we would be the lowest risk of applying to today. So that's the concept. I'm not going to walk you through the uh, process of, of doing that. I mean, I think many of you understand it's going to be wind direction related. It's going to be nighttime condition related, and, and I'll, when you come to the table over there, I'll kind of share a little bit of that. But uh, we, we, and this table is the table we use to identify what are the conditions that convert to low and high risk, and then we convert that low and high risk to a weather forecast that they're given, and they identify when those high risk periods are, and what direction is the wind blowing at that time and which field has neighbors that are going to be at high risk. So which fields do I want to avoid on that particular day? So I'll, I'll walk you through a little more of that when we do the hands-on. But that's the, the odor uh, uh, risk assessment and the using weather forecast to predict that, that we, we're walking them through. This is a, a worksheet that we've had for several years for calculating the value of manure. One side is just a blank one, and there's a second side that's all been filled in. Uh, we started off doing these calculations with the folks. Uh, I, I don't know that's, if that was all that great of an idea. Uh, more towards the end of it, we were uh, just putting the, uh, here's a, a, an example of a uh, feedlot manure sample, and we do the calculations all in advance. And really what we're trying to get to them to look at is at the bottom of that graph, or that, that page, there's a circle diagram. Uh, and, it, and it shows for the calculations that that farmer has done, how much of the value is in terms of phosphorus, how much is in potassium and nitrogen, how much is in the, in the, uh, the yield increase that you can get. And so uh, we tended to go more to already pre-done examples and then if they want to do this on their own, we encourage that. But if you have that graphic at the bottom, that circle, that pie chart, and you begin to realize uh, where my value of my manure is, then we take that knowledge and convert it into this uh, map again. And we've given you a little field test information about fertility status of these four different fields. And we have a discussion around which field is going to get the greatest value? And they begin recognizing that uh, how little value they get on some fields and how significant that value is on other fields. And then we start asking, all right, can you drive two or three miles to occur that value? Or is it better just to stay close to your feedlot and, and give up that value? And that, that presents some pretty interesting conversations and uh, I think a, a pretty quick recognition. I, I might ought to go a little bit further than, uh, than what I have in the past. So that's the two exercises that we use this map for, the, 
the uh, identifying which field uh, from an odor risk perspective on a specific day and a weather forecast, and then from a value manure perspective. So the other one that I did this year that's new is the setbacks and stockpiling. And like I said, this is where I had zero presentation. <coughs> And I do have a couple of copies of this. I don't have a lot of copies of it, but here's the what it looks like. This is the, the PDF of it. I gave them a map. This actually happens to be my home farm or one of my home farms. And uh, I gave them the map and I said, these anything with a smiley is a residence, anything with a little purple circle is a domestic or an irrigation well, and then um, talking about the setbacks, we also have municipal well setbacks that are, are larger. And they're totally irrelevant in this particular situation because it's a ways away. This is a, um, this is a mile section. So they're, they're plenty far away that it's not a big issue, but I kind of threw them in there. They are close by my house. And so um, it's nice to know that they are, like, to get an idea of where that setback actually is even though it's totally irrelevant here is to set back somewhere in, in this range. Um, so, so I just have, this as a blown up and I overlaid a topographic map so you can kind of see the lay of the land. This is the, actually the, the screenshot is from a web soil survey. And so I, I took it from there and then went, went with it. The other piece of this that we, we asked them to do was to figure out where they were gonna stockpile that manure. Not only, what setbacks do you have because of neighbor's wells, but also where are you gonna stockpile that manure over the winter? If you're hauling it out in the fall to spread in the spring, or you're hauling it during this growing season to spread in the fall, where are you gonna put that stockpile? Um, one of the things that I discovered as we were teaching it this year is I forgot to put where the field entrances are. <laughs> it's kind of important. So um, we did ask, or did we, we did tell the, the educators that so they had it. I did provide a cheat sheet for the educators with more information about the area, so when folks asked questions, they could do so. Uh, they, they had a little bit of knowledge of the area. Uh, so, so then the other piece of this that was purely for, uh, just purely for information and getting people thinking about what they're doing when they're using manure was because there's not really any specific regulations per se of this and there's definitely no right answer is I have them say okay I'm taking the manure from this operation over here to the farm over here how am I going to get it there and really think about neighbors think about what roads are good um, think about whether or not you want to meet your own trucks that kind of thing um, and I, I have to admit I stole this idea from Iowa State uh, after I had uh, taken one of the, went to one of their trainings and they didn't give me permission before I stole it. But I essentially recreated it from something that they were doing. And so um, the other thing that we talked about is, it doesn't show it on here, but if you do have a, a particular neighbor that is kind of not very nice or maybe more sensitive to think about them uh, or if you're hauling in the winter time to a stockpile location, because that's totally legal in Nebraska, uh, not in some states, I realize, but um, where's the snow load gonna be? Is there bridges that you need to avoid? Because this doesn't, you can pretty well guess where the bridges are because of, you can see the streams, but it doesn't specifically say weight limits or anything like that. And so I did, as part of the educators, they did have access to where to go get that information. So that's the setbacks and stockpiling activity. Erica? So I'm gonna switch gears with you guys a little bit here. Um, and so something that we're really trying to work on um, at Michigan State Extension is getting our equine owners on board as far as manure management. So. Our equine, and I, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, um, manure is not necessarily the first thing that they're thinking about with their animals. So horses, 
are treated as companion animals and unfortunately not necessarily managed as livestock. And coming from an equine background, I can say that I just, I didn't know what I didn't know until I came into this field more so. And so um, my colleague, Dr. Christine Skelly and I decided to put together kind of a cohort of information and youth activities um, so that some of our 4-H groups can start doing this kind of stuff, some of the youth programs that we offer through Extension. Hopefully this is a way that we can kind of get them thinking about it. Um, and the idea is that then some of the youth leaders can present this and in turn it's kind of a train the trainer situation. So a lot of our, our youth leaders are actually learning as they're doing this too. So while this is set up to be more of a youth type activity set, a lot of the adults really enjoy it as well because it's very hands-on. So initially we tried this with Detroit Horsepower. We have a, a really nice um, relationship with them and tried it with their kids and they loved it. And then we were actually just out at the American Youth Horse Council annual symposium in Idaho in the beginning of March and did this with the adults. And the, the responses we got um, just verbally and such were just really great. Everybody was super interactive about it. So I'm hoping we can get something started with that. So basically what we've done with this PowerPoint is put together the information that our specific youth leaders would need in order to teach their youth about manure management with horses. So within the PowerPoint, we actually put together lesson plans as far as the materials they would need for the activities, how to run the activity, and kind of looking at the goals of the activity, and then what some of those outcomes were from the activity. What are some of the things the kids are learning? So um, you can't see it here, but within each of the different activities, that lesson plan is in that PowerPoint for them. So if they want that, they can take it. And they don't have to use all the activities. They can just kind of do one at a time and kind of make it into a series for their, for their youth. So we talk a lot about just getting um, an understanding of the amount of manure, because that's something that a lot of our horse owners aren't necessarily thinking about. So we discuss all the different inputs that lead to that output of manure and how much they're actually producing. Um, and we've got fun graphics to use for it because the kids like it. And honestly, as an adult, it's a little more fun than sometimes just seeing your typical statistical PowerPoints about things. Um, and these are people who don't necessarily think in that mindset either. So this is a lot easier to get the message across to them. So we actually have... Um, so, so we go through how much a horse produces per day, per month, per year. And it's astounding to be able to show them that, um, as well as the bedding that's used. So uh, some, of our, some of our facilities use less bedding. Some just pick the stalls out. Others are cleaning out on a more consistent basis. And so we get a lot of shavings in there, straw, um, other bulking agents like that. So we help them understand, number one, the weight, and we do comparatives as far as different, um, we use like a 50-pound feed sack, 20-pound bird seed bag, and then a 5-pound bag of candy. Candy is very popular with both the adults and kids, so we found that to be very effective. Um, and then the other thing we do, too, is help them understand not only the weight of that manure, but also the size. How much does that actually take up? So... We go through um, kind of with boxes and then balloons, and we show them that it's, it's a pretty large volume that these horses are producing in just manure alone, not even including the bedding. Um, and put it in perspective as far as one horse producing this. And so most of them are going to have anywhere from two to five horses on average. And so I think that kind of seemed to resonate with them. Then we start looking at the environmental side of things as far as how manure and water don't mix. So, um, so we start talking about, again, what are some of those nutrients that are actually coming out of those horses and where is that coming from? And then we start looking at situations as far as where do you, sh where should you put that manure? So 
some of the mentality, and this is speaking from some of uh, the experiences I have heard from some of my equine extension colleagues, some of our horse owners, in order to get more pasture land, like the idea of taking that manure and filling in wetlands with it. <laughs> And so, and, and, and I, I laugh about it, but when I, when I think back to the days of when I didn't know any better, it seemed like a logical thought process because you don't realize the amount of nutrients and other things and potential pathogen issues that you can have with that. So it is, it is a real, real thing, and we have to educate them about that. So... The activity we use for this, we actually take sponges and we take little boxes, clear boxes, and fill it with water. And then the sponge, the idea is to show them that when that soil is oversaturated and you have manure on that soil, you're going to lose some of those nutrients. So we actually, so we saturate the sponge and then we take food coloring and put it on the sponge. And I said, now squeeze it. And they'll squeeze. And when they squeeze and put it back in the water, it all just comes right off and that water turns all kinds of disgusting colors. And, and just watching their eyes kind of light up to realize, wow, this is, this is actually happening. There's nutrients coming off. And so it's a really good activity for them to understand why it's important that we choose the right location um, and the timing of that. So we go through the uh, bad <laughs> situation of stockpiling that manure, the good situation, and what the better or best situation is. So, um, and we talk through them with why that's good. So, and we use on the bottom here how, you know, excess nutrients getting into the water can lead to algal overgrowth, it can lead to oxygen depletion, and then when you get some kind of permeable surface, like concrete, or if it's a good solid clay that you're putting that manure on, you're going to have less nutrients coming off, and you're going to have some happier aquatic life because you're not leaching into that water or running off into that water. And then the idea of covering the manure storage, if possible, or finding a place they can cover it, or even with a tarp, something simple that they can grasp onto that they don't have to spend a lot of money on, something that they can physically, actively do quickly to help divert that clean water away and keep that manure dry. And then we do talk about composting. So I'm actually meeting with a horse owner on Monday to talk about some composting they're doing. The big thing in our state is trying to figure out how to advertise horse manure as compost because we know the nutrient content is pretty, pretty minimal in horse manure compared to our other livestock. And so most of our farmers don't, they don't want that horse manure. So we're kind of working through that right now, but being able to explain to them that if it's done properly, you can actually use it on your own flower beds, you can use it in your own garden if you want, and it ultimately can reduce the size of that pile to about half of what it originally was, which is huge for our horse industry, being able to really minimize that amount of manure because a lot of times they don't know what to do with it. So if there's less of it, it makes it a little easier to kind of think about where they're gonna take that manure. So we go through these points with them. The other big thing that's important for our horse owners as well is that it kills weed seeds, which is something that's really important when they put this on their pastures. Some will just spread it on their pastures, and so we highly recommend that they compost first because then you're not introducing other potentially invasive grass species as well as the pathogens and killing disease, which is huge for our horse owners. So then... Um, we go through, I, so this is my Playmobil set that I had as a kid, and it's actually worked super well because we do a farm, a simulated farm. We set it up and what it looks like, and then I have like a little poop emoji, um, Earl, I call him, and we place him on different parts of the farm and ask them, is this a good place to stockpile my manure? Is this a good place to store my manure? So we have a wetland we'll set it next to. We have an area next to the barn that we'll set it next to. So maybe it's not an environmental risk, but we're talking about a potential pathogen risk with our horses, more flies. They don't like that. The owners don't like it. And then we've got an actual storage we put it in. And by the time we get to this point, they know, like as soon as they see it, they know that it needs to go in that storage, that place that's covered, that place that has that impermeable surface. So, um, and... <laughs> 
We have made it up to, this is the last activity we've made it to with them. So I do have the calibration kits put together, which is why Leslie asked me if I would um, give a brief overview for you today. We just, we've run out of time. We haven't had time to get to that point in our presentations yet. So, um, but inside, when we do this indoors, we actually take candy, like I told you, and we'll do the TARP method for them and kind of what that looks like if they were actually to be out there with their own spreader and calibrating their own spreader. And so we'll take a five gallon bucket, um, just a nice little scale that we hold, and then we show them how to measure beforehand with the tarp, and then we dump a bunch of candy on it. And the kids do this, we make the kids do it. Um, and they'll gather it up and put it in there and they'll figure out, okay, how much, how much manure do we have on this tarp? And it really helps them get an idea of why we want to calibrate that spreader. So I do have a video that I like to show, it's just we haven't had the time in our presentations to get that far yet. Um, so this is what we go through with them. We call it Ready, Set, Tootsie Roll Part 1. So Tootsie Rolls are great because they look like little, little manure pieces. Hershey Kisses work really well also. So <clears throat> just some food for thought for you. Um, and then we do have the small scale uh, calibration. So I just have currently the um, solid manure kits because I mean, horse manure is a solid. We're not working with dairy manure. So, um, but different size sheets like Leslie had mentioned. And the other thing we were thinking about doing too, uh, I had originally glued chocolate sprinkles to the, to the, the little tarp. So um, luckily they smell good when you take them out. It's not actual manure smell. But we were thinking to cut out just the tarps and then use like little fun size bags of M&Ms where they can actually put that manure on themselves while it's on the scale so they can physically see what that looks like. So we haven't gotten that far yet, but I do think that this is something um, that a lot of our, our kiddos would enjoy. So that's kind of what this part is here. And then we have this final picture that we kind of show them this, this is what it would look like to do all of these things. So um, I think what's been great is even in the 50 minute presentation we had in Idaho, everybody was incredibly engaged the whole time because of the hands-on activities that we had. And a lot of them seemed to think that this really could potentially be, or these could be activities that they could take back to their youth to show them, to help educate them. So yeah, I think that's all I have.